here. Are you ready for this? I'm back in the beat. Call me Dean and you're hungry, my man. We're thrilled to have you after the get together. I want to introduce Rose's boyfriend. I'm Chris. Good to see another brother around here. Something is weird. Come in and sit with us. Sink. I can't move. Why can't I move? You're paralyzed. Get out. Get out. Get out. Rated R. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second Oscar podcast for this week. Amazing. Exciting. I, I, I'm really excited today uh, because I have, or tonight, I should say, because it's 6 p.m. my time and 2 a.m. her time, uh, I have Kaylee Donaldson of Pajiba with me today. Hello, Kaylee. Hello. I'm very excited to have you. Um we were discussing a little bit earlier, just all cards on the table. I've known Kaylee, I guess, internet land wise for how long did we say now? Like 12 years, maybe? By my estimation, it's about 12 years. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. It's, we'll just leave that at that. Um, but yeah, so what are we going to do today? We are going to talk about uh, Golden Globe nominations, which are Monday. Um, it is Friday tonight, and then a little bit of Screen Actors Guild, which is the Wednesday following. So it's a really, really big week uh, for award stuff. Um, the the two the two first majors to to, to hit us, um, and we're gonna talk about the Golden Globes first. Uh, I did post my final predictions today which I do not feel comfortable with at all because there is so much circling that could happen. Um, and I think uh, the th thing I'm kind of thinking about right now uh, and was part of the focus of what I wrote today was what's going to happen with Get Out. Because when it was submitted for a comedy musical, even though I totally agree with the placement of of that there was a lot of chatter and disagreement and conversation and argument and a lot of things going on uh twitter specifically and part of me thinks that's a great thing uh that any any conversation about it even if it's not bad but just kind of argumentative is still a good thing and i've seen some pretty high profile pundits uh thinking that it's going to be dismissed pretty heavily at the Globes. And I'm kind of not thinking that that's going to happen. I feel sort of the opposite. I feel like it's going to go pretty big there. It's a very small group, obviously, just 90 or so people. They're all international journalists living in, in uh, Southern California. And will they understand the 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 multiple genres and tones that the movie's going for. So, Kaylee, I'm curious what you think about uh, that specifically, about Get Out. Yeah, well, I agree that I, I think it was placed in the right category, although the entire division of the Golden Globes category is always bonkers. Mm -hmm. Like, whatever is considered a comedy musical by them is, is always a weird thing. But I think they made the right call here because Jordan Peele himself said, yeah, it's a, not a funny topic, but it's a funny film. Um, I've, I think it's going to do really well because one of the things that's been really fascinating about this award season we've had is just how much we've seen the trends bucked and the sort of implications and associations of what we consider the usual narrative have just gone out the window. I mean, this is a film that's held on to all of that buzz since February. And it's probably, I think it's still one of the most talked about films of the year, and especially in this kind of consideration, the, the way that people were talking about this on Twitter is just a sign of that. You know, people are really passionate about this movie. And I think if you even get like, what, 30 or so journalists in, in the Hollywood Foreign Press Association to vote for this thing, I think it could go far. I mean, for me, the only competition I would say, particularly with this group of voters, I think would be the disaster artist. Because it's the whole, you know, Hollywood movies about Hollywood or about filmmaking, I think would be the only big challenge to them. But it's, I, I, I feel weird even saying that, actually putting together my own predictions, just realizing this is the first year in a long time where I'm like, I really don't know and I kind of love it. I'm yeah. just very up in the air about most things. And I, 
it's really exciting for a change. <laughs> it, it it is. I'm I'm feeling like that about almost everything this season. But yeah, looking even just at the two, you know, coming right at us, the the Globes and Screen Actors Guild. I I am I'm complete. I don't have confidence <laughs> in being able to to predict a lot of this accurately because it's it's hard to know. I think too what this small group is going to is going to look at if they're going to have influences uh outside of of their their own their own thoughts from you know everything from last year's oscars to anything that's happened uh politically and socially this year they're a little bit less inclined to do that traditionally um than than the oscars have been but i i th- i think it might happen i can still i can still see that happening but it's i i I do feel super strong about get out um i it even though like you said it's you know it came out in february and it had all of this time to kind of gestate while other you know award season stuff started gearing up at festivals and all of that um and it's been able to to maintain its place as one of the best films of the year and as uh top 10 start coming in it's inevitably going to be on more lists and probably on more number one placements uh than almost any film and and it it needs that it's it has a lot of things working against it the type of film that it is and the release date that it has but i feel like it's going to to do well here but you know that's that could, that could be completely wrong. <laughs> that is that sort of thing is really interesting about this year, and I I theorized this on Twitter actually. I think one of the things that Moonlight's win did was almost give people permission to just stop assuming that everything that they'd seen in the past would continue to happen with award season. Mm-hmm. The idea that oh this film came out in February, it's not got a chance. Oh this film is a genre film, it's not going to work. Oh this is far too niche or, or whatever and i think it also just gave people sort of permission to embrace the films that they wholeheartedly like and people really love. you know it's a brilliant piece of work and it is on a lot of top 10 lists i think it was sight and sounds top film of the year actually yes it was uh, which is which is certainly going to help it um but it's also just a film that's really easy to get excited about in the same way that i think ladybird it, maybe you know obviously there are differences there but people have em- embraced those films in a really kind of wholeheartedly enthusiastic way that's really hard to fake that kind of buzz you know you can't you can put together as many for your consideration campaigns as you want but if you can't get people to actually talk about the film in an organic matter yes. it's really not going to be for much and i think get out has that in its favor and the golden globes like they like to kind of buck trends but they also really love to start them you know they love to get people talking and say that they were the ones that started that off which is one of the reasons that their show is kind of the first in the season mm-hmm. but you know whether that's someone giving a really good speech or whether it's just the, the right film at the right time or whatever they do like that so if they were to give get out you know the big sweep here you know that would be something they would they would love to do and it would be something that would seriously help the film in the long run i think yes and and uh one of the things i mentioned in the the thing i wrote today is that there's i feel like there's almost two ways it can go for the film either they can kind of just push it for everything that it can possibly get in and and there it is uh or it can get a pretty seriously snubbed and it doesn't actually matter either way in this sense of it will still have conversation if that film gets snubbed no matter what else gets in, the conversation is going to be get out, got snubbed at the Golden Globes. That's, that's Oh yeah, definitely. That's going to be it. So in, in a weird way, regardless of what happens, it's still going to be able to be uh, the conversation piece. Uh, and, 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 and that's one of the things I think that is so important. Uh, the podcast I did earlier this week with Kyle Buchanan, he, he made just a really excellent point that Voters are going to look at and and choose the thing and the movie that is that speaks to them right now the most, and even though that might not exactly be the the wheelhouse for for the Golden Globes, I I still think they can see, especially those that live here, um, they can see what what a story like that means to 
the social and political stance of of people in the United States. So I oh definitely, and there's a lot of that this year as well. But there's just a lot of films that people are really excited about. I mean, looking at like you know the predictions I've put together, I think there's very few films on that list that feel like placeholders. There's just a lot there that people are genuinely excited to talk about and excited to go and see and excited to have that conversation around them, which is another thing that is so interesting about this year is all a lot of the films that we kind of predicted as, well, this is the thing that they'll probably vote for whether it's good enough or not. And we <laughs> haven't seen that at all, really. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, every Matt Damon social satire this year, just no one cares. Yes, exactly. I mean, the, the the Globes might be a place that the, that that could find a little bit of, of footing, but but it doesn't seem like too much. Um, and it's funny you you what we sort of just just uh, uh, mentioned. I'm looking at like my predictions for for comedy musical at the Globes, and obviously that's what we've been talking about with Get Out. And I I have two actual full fledged musicals outside of the top five which to me seems super crazy because the globes really traditionally will grab onto anything that is actually a musical and be like yes let's just put it in because we have you know musical in our damn title but i have like beauty and the beast and the greatest showman totally outside of of the top five See, I have The Greatest Showman in there just for the sort of reasoning that you say, and also because Hugh Jackman is hustling for that thing so hard. Yes. Um, when he should be hustling for Logan, which is one of the best films of the year. Yes. Uh, and he's not, and it still annoys me. Um, I'm, I'm so baffled by The Greatest Showman. I haven't seen it yet, but every time I see an ad, I'm just like, what is this? I know. Why is this here? <laughs> I, it's, it's, I, think, I think I said something the other day. It's like, this movie is so weird. I feel like it's already come out and nobody liked it. And that was that. <laughs> it's already done. But it hasn't even come out yet. And they're embargoing reviews until day of. Oh, that's always a wonderful sign, isn't and, it? And it's also, it's on, it's not even on the, the, the 20th Century Fox screening list. All their other movies are, except for that. That's a bad sign. <laughs> oh, are they just hoping people will be like, oh, well, we like Hugh Jackman, which would probably work in the Globe's favor, actually, because a big part of voting for that is who do we really want to get drunk with? exactly and that that's 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 a lot of the globes and that's one of the most fun things is is how kind of freewheeling it is um but yeah it's it's weird i i totally see where you're going with with having it in and i do have jackman in uh for actor because that category is just kind of ready made for that but it's i again i don't feel comfortable not having beauty and the beast and the greatest showman out but i just I just see stronger films getting in. And if it's it's kind of a weird balance. If they nominate Jackman uh, for actor, then that kind of covers that base and they get him there. They don't need to put it in motion picture. <laughs> they get they get everybody else that they want to get there, you know, by getting their Lady Bird and Itania and Disaster Artist and Get Out. Uh, and actually I have the big sick in there too. Um, so do I. Yeah, it's that's kind of where I'm at with that. It's and it's a really tough category, and I. It's funny because this category sometimes feels like a bit of a throwaway, because you'll get these acting and uh, picture nominations that feel like they're padding out five spaces, and that is not the case this year. Oh yeah, I mean, even just drama, best drama was one that I really struggled with because I thought, oh, this is quite easy, and then I got to about number four and thought, there's about eight different films I could probably put in here, mm-hmm. and e- they could easily fit the, the Globe's kind of voting standards. So I didn't include the Florida Project, for instance, which I think yep. could easily build that kind of buzz. And I saw it on Thursday, and I absolutely loved it. Oh, I didn't I put in it. Wonder Woman, which I think has another really good chance. Uh, I came very close to putting Gal Gadot in drama actress because that also feels like a very globes move and that's actually <laughs> i think a category where there's a lot more movement in in it, around it you know there's a lot of names that could slip in and out there oh yes uh, i agree i agree um and actually let's just go right to it because you know actresses it's kind of like a thing i like <laughs> it um <laughs> it's i i agree it's a really open category um and part of the reason is that there's uh, the, the way that the Hollywood foreign press decides 
that certain movies go into certain categories uh, makes uh, uh, this thing kind of difficult. Um, they've been heavily, heavily criticized in the past for uh, either accepting placements that uh, have been given a lot of side eye or moving things. Um, like, for example, actually with uh, actress, uh, drama actress, uh, Salma Hayek for Beatrice Dinner was originally submitted in comedy, but the Hollywood Foreign Press said, no, it's going to go drama. And there she is in there. Um, and that's tough because it it is a movie that is, I would say, three quarters comedy. And then it gets to, to pretty serious drama. But then other things are like that, too. So it's 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 hard to, to figure out where they're going to go with it or whether it actually should be. Yeah, because I had her in under comedy just because it seemed like yes a more an atrophy i didn't realize that the categorization had happened there um but that, that i think that's one of the things that's so interesting about the golden globes is a lot of their decisions seem to have been made when they've already started drinking which <laughs> I'm, I'm not against um it makes it a lot more interesting i'm, I'm totally fine with that yes. um so I, I was really quite intrigued by the actress stuff this year i it's it's dishearteningly white which i'm not wild about yes um but you know, there's a lot of you know, a lot of passion choices in there that I think could be made. There's a lot of kind of old favorites. There's a lot of ones building with a juggernaut. Really, you know, there's so many different ways I think they could take drama actress alone, and I find that really exciting. So I have you know Meryl Streep, Sally Hawkins, Frances McDormand. I put in Annette Bening because I think you know she's kind of an old favorite. Uh, and then I put in Jennifer Lawrence because it's Jennifer Lawrence, even though Mother is. A very abrasive and divisive film but it's also one that if you love it you tend to really love it and you want everyone to know that so mm -hmm. it's that kind of thing i think works in these people's favors as well as who do you want to sit next to at the party but you know I, you could easily take out one of those names and put in you know i think jessica chastain is a very viable choice i think gal gadot could happen kate winslet really wants it to happen i, I have no uh, idea if the optics of the situation will help that that's just oh i have a lot God. of feelings on that or or her 33 percent rotten tomato score no it's not happening oh. <laughs> no oh bless I, I, I did notice that she'd kind of slacked on the the late night talk show duties and suddenly jim belushi was doing all of them <laughs> yeah that, which that, i find very interesting yeah that's that's not good yeah, and then that interview that she did were like, oh, Woody Allen really loves female characters. And God. really, he's like a woman inside. I'm like, girl, you just like, you you, you took your, your campaign, you dragged it to the basement after you beat it to death, and you're just you're just cementing it right at the stairs right there. It's done. So you already have an Oscar. You've got like James Cameron money coming in. You don't need to do this. Oh my god! And I like her shameless first day campaigns, but this was just oh man. I, I do too. Speaking of James Cameron, she's going to be in the Avatar sequel. So yeah, good luck with that, Kate. Mm -mm. <laughs> like all of them, or uh, at least the the next one. Maybe it'll be like the uh, those Shailene Woodley movies, and and she'll just get shot in the head by Naomi Watts. I don't know. We'll see how that works out <laughs> for her. Uh, <laughs> oh my god, I'm going to get so much like Kate Winslet oh. hate mail. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Liron. Especially you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, I mean, those Avatar sequels could take up decades of her career. <laughs> At least decades of time. I hope that. My god. Jeez, just like take her away for a couple of years. Are but... they going to put her in the Animal Kingdom theme park at Disneyland? <laughs> oh, that would be so nice. <laughs> No, oh, please would, put in Kate Winslet animatronic somewhere. <laughs> that would be... It wouldn't actually be an animatronic, though. It would actually be her. So <laughs> that would be the best part. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, we got to move on. Otherwise, I'm just going to... Oh, my God. People are going to be like, I'm turning this off. This Kate Winslet song is really hurting my feelings. No disrespect, man, except for the Woody Allen stuff. <laughs> except for the Woody Allen stuff, which is like 100% disrespect, exactly. Um, you mentioned Jessica Chastain. I totally have her in. She made it in for like... That Miss Sloan movie, she could totally make it in here. Oh um, yeah, and she's also like once again, she's she hustles hard for it. And also, I think in terms of what's happening in the climate right now, politically, yes. culturally, as one of the few very vocal A-list voices talking about this and not bullshitting around the subject, you know, the optics of that are very good in her favor. Not to downplay the quality of her work or anything like that, but you know, we all know how much you know your own personality uh, plays a part in actually getting that award as much as the work that you do. Yes. 
Yes, and luncheons and all that stuff. No, you're right. She has been, and she's like, you know, names, names, and she does not mess around. Uh, and, and I love that. And it's, it's, it's the thing that is going to keep her uh, above a lot of contenders. Um, I begrudgingly put in Diane Kruger today as an official prediction. And oh my See, god! I, I thought about uh. her just because she seems to have been everywhere for about the past month. You know, after Can, she kind of disappeared a bit. You know, she won her award. She was very happy about that. Good for her. And then she seems to have made this sudden resurgence, which which makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you're going to capitalize on that, why not go all the way? Um, I, I'm curious to see how it plays. I mean, if it's going to play with anyone, it'll play with the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. Yes. But in the long term, it would be interesting to see if that could lead to something. I wouldn't be against it. I haven't seen the movie, but um, I would. I have seen it, and I would be against it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, that bad? Uh, it's it's not that it's bad. It's just um, it's basic. It is. It's like Actress One Hundred and One. It's it's it hits all the beats that you would do if you're like, if you went to your agent and said, "Okay, I I need a script and I need a movie that's going to get me awards, and I need you to find it, and it needs to have." trauma uh it needs to have me doing a whole bunch of drugs uh random sex uh i need all of those things and it does and it does it in a way that just comes out like so unnaturally i'm just like i don't even care about anything that's happening to you i just bleh, i didn't i didn't care for the movie at all but i think it could play very well because again we're talking about a very small amount of people that have to make these decisions and you go to luncheons and meet and greets, and that's kind of, that's that's a big thing. That's that's how you do it. Um, it's a little harder to do later on, um, but like I mean, Kruger is already like a Screen Actors Guild nominee by herself. So that watch out for that possibly happening, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so I I can see it, but then yeah, I look at my others and uh, and. Uh, yeah, Annette Benning, like you said, Sony Pictures Classics does pretty well here, and as as a, a character, I think I think she could do. I think she could get in. Um, oh, my Vicky, my Vicky Kreps from Phantom Thread. I would die if she could get in here, because it might be my favorite female performance of the year. Oh wow, that's that's some high praise coming from you. It's I I was. I was just not prepared, and it's the kind of thing that, because to me she's a one hundred percent newcomer, so I she has no baggage coming in from me, um, and everything I saw was just like fire and magic and just fierce. Oh my god, I am I'm obsessed with this performance. It's it's amazing. I I was seeing like little glimpses of young Meryl Streep throughout all of her performance and I was just constantly stunned by it. I love her. I'm obsessed with her right now. She's fantastic. But I really want to see that movie because I'm a huge Paul Thomas Anderson fan. I think that could prop there, there's no reason that couldn't happen. I mean we know that one of the things that award season really loves is an ingenue mm -hmm. and there isn't really a young female ingenue this year. It's interesting that that narrative is going to a guy for once. Because yeah. usually it's, you know, the, the young, beautiful 24-year-old woman wins Best Actress, and then it's the craggy-faced character actor who wins Best Actor. So it's mm -hmm. interesting to see that kind of flipped this year with, with Timothy Chalamet. I yeah. think that's partly because it's like, there's a lot of baggage with all these guys right now. We don't know what's going to happen. Let's just pick the very young guy and pretend he's not doing a Woody Allen movie. Um, uh, yeah, let's pretend that hasn't happened <laughs> yet, so, or at all. So I, I'm fascinated by that. I would love to see Vicky Creeps get in just because that is such a great story. And also, you know, I'm fascinated by people who think that Paul Thomas Anderson is this great kind of Oscar bait vehicle, because <laughs> it's particularly with his most recent films, he's made almost like really abrasive anti-Oscar bait that occasionally gets nominated despite itself. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, 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 the Daniel Day-Lewis power will kind of propel that one forward for more than himself. Yeah, I, I, be good. I, I agree. I think there I think a lot of people are looking to uh, There Will Be Blood as, as, as if it was a regular thing and not an an anomaly because he's been able to generate lots of nominations, you know, for, you know, actors and stuff and a couple of things here, but not really much for himself or for the movie uh, as, as a whole. 
um, except for there will be blood, and that was a kind of a big deal. But it doesn't mean that everything after that is gonna is gonna do that. Look at the Cohen brothers; they hit huge with Fargo, and since then has been crap with Oscars. So it's you, you never know with with these with these Indian auteur types. You know, if it's the Academy just being like, okay, we're gonna reward you now because we kind of want to look cool and you're cool and let's be cool together. And then it's like a one and done because the Academy does really love one and dones. But, um, I, I, I would love to see Phantom Thread be kind of a bigger deal here. I'm worried because it was such a very late thing. Sometimes it's great and sometimes it's just not enough. Uh, the last three movies that, uh, the Hollywood foreign press saw were the post and Phantom Thread. And then, I do know, I mean, it was even uh, reported, too, that All the Money in the World was able to sneak in uh, before their December 4th deadline with Christopher Plummer. See, he just makes me, Ridley Scott just makes me feel so damn lazy. I was so proud to have all my work done. He's like, no, I've just finished, like, a whole reshoot of a movie with some other guy in the time that it's taken you to, like, redo an essay. So screw you. Um, I, I didn't know about putting that on my list, to be honest. I haven't put it in any categories. I've kind of got Christopher Plummer as a possible spoiler just because of the sheer, like, yes, fascinating kind of novelty value of it. Me too. Because, I mean, I wasn't interested in seeing that movie until all of this happened. It's like, well, I have to see what it looks like, at least. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know who I'd knock out a supporting actor in that front. I mean, maybe Mark Rylance. Um, oh, I already because... knocked him out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have him in there just because I think it's another easier way to kind of give an award, or not even an award, just like recognition to Dunkirk, which I feel people are almost underrating uh, over these past couple of months. Um, but there isn't really a central actor focus there except for maybe Rylance, so that's, that was my justification. Um, so unless one of the, the Call Me By Your Name guys wants to, you know, take one out for the team, then maybe you could get in Plummer there. But, you know, um, Army Hammer is hustling way too hard to let that happen. Yeah, there's no way he's not getting in. Um, but I actually do have both the, the Call Me By Your Name guys getting in, so I... Yeah, so do I. Cause, um, it better happen. I, like, like, I, I really want Michael Stuhlbarg to get more, you know, I was rooting for him to get an Oscar nomination since a serious man, so this just feels like, you know, final payback. For real. And he's having too good a year to be ignored, I think. He's in everything. He is in three likely Best Picture nominees. He's He's gonna get in. And in terms of Golden Globes as well, I mean, he's in Fargo season three, and I have that as... Oh, um, yes. So, you know, that's something that could definitely happen. Yeah. It's, you know, I, and I think that when you're just mm. around, there's a good narrative around you. You know, this guy's in everything. Although, I don't have Ben Mendelsohn on my list, and he's kind either. of in a similar trajectory. But I think if Darkest Hour does get anything, it'll be for Oldman, and I think that's almost just because we've bought into so much of that story now. Uh, that feels like the most traditionally Oscar Beatty kind of story of the year to me. But even then, it's kind of losing steam because all the critics' love for actors is going to Tim Fish Alamey. And it's it's funny because, I mean, you even mentioned at the very beginning is is that, you know, there's a lot of these things where people feel like, oh, well, this is the type of movie that, you know, gets these kind of things. And Darkest Hour and Dunkirk are both those kind of movies. Um, and I, I feel like both of them need to do pretty well next week. Otherwise, we're seeing the tea leaves of what the future of movie awards is like. And and that is pretty much waving goodbye to the traditional biopics and, and World War II movies and things like that. Although, you know, we just saw Hacksaw Ridge get multiple nominations and uh, wins this year. So there's, I feel like there's a precipice right now that is, I don't know how long it's going to last between what was and what is going to be, but it's, that's kind of where we're, we're at right now. Um, and that, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I'm sad for Dunkirk on that aspect because I actually think Dunkirk is brilliant and it's easily the best thing Christopher Nolan's ever done. It's a great I think film. so much of buying into that was also the idea that, well, it's obviously going to be this kind of movie based on 
what we know about World War II movies based on what we know about prestige dramas and what we know about Christopher Nolan. And it's kind of not any of those things. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like Christopher Nolan just sat down and was like, what am I really crap at? Writing female characters, third act <laughs> exposition, dialogue. And he was just like, I'm not going to do any of that. And it's brilliant. And I was, I was never so glad to see so few women in a movie, actually. I was like, I'm not anywhere in this film. It's great. That is um, a really so- hilarious point. <laughs> I, I would love to see more love for Dunkirk, but honestly, I don't know what I'd drop in favour of Dunkirk in just this kind of area. Yes. And I, will say, I have not seen that much just because of UK release dates. Of course, um, of course. But, you know, the this, this stuff that everyone's really excited for, I, I can't begrudge that excitement. There's nothing on this list that's like, oh, screw this, you know. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that I'm even really ambivalent about, which is interesting for a change. <laughs> yeah, when I, I look at... Just room. When, yeah, when I look at what's, like, really, like, in contention, I'm like, um, I really like this. Oh, I like that, too. All right. Cool. That makes it so much harder. <laughs> I'll have to bring you back for, for BAFTA stuff, because that'll be super fun. Oh, I can do that. I'm, okay. I'm there. <laughs> Good. I'm all right. We're all about that. Um, let's let's move on to Screen Actors Guild because um, we're yeah you know we just spent like almost forty minutes on that. Whatever. Who cares? Um, yeah. Let's. Oh my God. I'm I'm super. I'm probably almost more nervous. Nervous might not be the right word, but for uh, predictions for this because it is. With the Hollywood Foreign Press, it's 90 people trying to do, you know, pull together predictions, but sort of in the same place, and they all see the same screenings. With the Screen Actors Guild, you have this nomination committee, which is about 2,200 people of 200,000 or 160,000, and they can be from all over the country. And as we know, every single year, these people are screener dependent on seeing these contenders. Not everybody lives in L.A. and New York, and they can't just run down to the theater and see The Post and Phantom Thread and I, Tanya and all of these things that come out in December. If you don't have your screener in the hand of your SAG nomcom member, you're not getting a nomination. And the, that nomination is then going to go to something from September or October that's had their screener out for months. And that's how we see weird stuff. That's how we see Emily Blunt and Sarah Silverman. And it's, it's, that's just how it is. So that was my little bit of rant for that. Um, and it's what makes all of these so damn difficult. Um, I don't know about you, but the category that I am struggling with the most is the main category. And that's cast in a motion picture. Yeah, I and once I started writing down sort of predictions, I was like thinking about what you said as well and kind of the context that this stuff gets decided. But even in, you know, the the, the list of favorites, which is easily about twice the length of, of the category itself. Yes. Uh, but stuff like, you know, I really wonder, I, I struggled whether or not to put Mudbound on the list. And I have ultimately put it there, but as kind of a spoiler with Get Out, because um, I think Mudbound needs the SAG nomination. And I think because it is on Netflix, it is that kind of screener thing is like, there's really no excuse. You can just go on and watch it. Mm -hmm. But the problem with being a Netflix movie on top of, you know, everything else that it has to contend with, with the Academy and that kind of snobbery is it's really hard to hold on to the buzz in the way that you get with like a limited screen release and then up it from four screens to 20 to 100 or whatever. We've seen with a lot of Netflix films, it goes on Netflix and then that's it. You know, yeah. I think you saw this with um, First They Killed My Father, the yeah. the Angelina Jolie movie, which is great, mm-hmm. which you really, I think if that was on the festival circuit more, there were, people would be talking about it, but it went straight onto Netflix and Netflix didn't even treat it like it was a big deal. And, you know, not Mudbound got treated a little bit better just because of the sheer amount of money they spent on it. Yes. Um, but even then, you know, you, you can't manufacture that kind of hype. You've got to get people infused for it. And... I'm sadly not seeing much of that from Mudbound, which is a shame because really it's the sort of thing that could use it. I, I do have it on my list, but I, you know it is that kind of passion that it would need um, because I don't have in I don't think I have it in any of my I've Mary J Blige in my Golden Globes predictions, but that's about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean I, I have I have Mudbound here and and Blige, and that's only because I almost feel like if Beasts of No Nation had not made the impact that it did, I probably would feel a less inclined. Uh, to have Mudbound here, but it's, like like you said, the accessibility uh, for 
a committee that is across this country, my country, sorry, um, and um, is is beneficial to a movie like this. It's extremely beneficial. Um, and I think that's why that movie was able to get the ensemble nomination that it did with three cast members uh, and then win for Idris Elba. So it's... I, 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 th- I think Mudbound is obviously in a better position awards-wise than that movie ever was. Um, but it's still, and in, in, I've, I've said this many times, Netflix is here to change the game, not play the game. They don't want to bend to the Academy's uh, rules or the way that they've done things. They want people to bend to them. And that's fine. I, I, I love... I love it when people want to disrupt a system, uh, so I, I'm totally fine with that. But it's it's a matter of when that is going to happen. I don't know if it's quite going to happen with Mudbound. I think it will happen at SAG. Um, but obviously, if if it doesn't happen here, that's it, and it's absolutely done because it's already on life support as it goes into SAG nominations. Which also, and I, I also think part of that is down to I don't think enough people in the trades and stuff have been doing enough to support the film. You know, like the Hollywood Reporter Roundtable. Why is De Reese not on that, for mm-hmm. instance? Yep. You know, why are we not seeing more of those actors getting around those tables? Because I know it's not all just about who's getting their publicist to hustle the most. A lot of it is just the people trying to set the narratives themselves. And you know, there is a really good narrative to set at that round table that they could have had by making it more racially diverse in a year where there are plenty of candidates and they didn't. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm still very salty about that because, you know, Jordan Peele definitely deserves to be on a writer's round table, but there's almost a consolation feeling to that for me. Like he should be at the director's seat. You know, yeah. he has directed the, the probably the most talked about film of the year. He is a debut director who's probably going to make history soon. Surely you would want to at least be part of that. Yeah. Um, so I, I have issues with that, but I do think that if Mudbound doesn't get in for the SAGs, I think Get Out probably will. Um, I actually but I, have I, them both. <laughs> yeah, I guess because I've really struggled with this one because I I ended up taking out Dunkirk and putting in free yes. billboards, and then I thought, well, is Mudbound going to go in here? Is Ladybird going to get in because of the screeners thing? But that's also a film that people are going out of their way to see and talk about, mm-hmm. so that may help it. Um, I was just very baffled by the the main category here. When it came down to individuals, it was a bit easier, but even then, it was just a similar kind of thing to the Golden Globes. Yeah, it's got the kind of talk around them right now. Yeah, um, but I do have um, there's a couple, and I have in SAG mm-hmm. that I don't have in Golden Globe for just because. Yeah, I, I think that the the Golden Globes are you know a, a, are happy to be a bit weirder just because. They, they kind of understand their own level of seriousness. Mm-hmm. I, I do think they're trying to be a little bit more uh, legitimized. I do think they're trying to be taken a little bit more seriously. Um, but yeah, with, 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 with SAG, the individual categories, I have like maybe three or four people outside of my top five that could be like spoilers. But for the top category, I have more spoilers than i do in the top five because that's it, interesting because it's so i mean i'll you know i'll lay it out i have call me by your name get out lady bird mudbound in the post that's as my nominees but then i look at the at the really easy obvious outside and it's three billboards shape of water dunkirk florida project darkest hour i Tanya, the big sick those are all completely realistic and I would re- I could replace almost anything on my list with one of those or more. I mean, how do how do I have oh, I, how do I have the shape of water outside of this? It's insane. How do I have three billboards outside with getting multiple uh, individual nominations? I I you I can't reconcile <laughs> my decisions. And when the Screen Actors Guild reveals their nominations. I'll say the same thing to them. I'm like, how can you reconcile having that in cast when you have zero or one nomination outside of it? And it's going to drive me nuts. 
<laughs> oh, it's it's the eternal struggle. It really is. It's that. Do you do you pick it based on you know, a really big ensemble on particular performances within that ensemble? Because you know something like the post is such a huge cast that it feels like it was kind of tailor made for the sacks in that aspect. Mm-hmm. You know, it is it is the ultimate spot that peak TV cast member yes. situation, which I, I I'm fascinated by. I do love the idea that Spielberg just caught up on his Netflix queue and was like, I like this person, let's put them in my movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but like even something like you know, I have a lot of really strong feelings in terms of how we treat child actors and the way we kind of sort of knock you know build them up and knock them down. And yet, I really want to see Brooklyn Prince get some sort of recognition for the Florida Project because I think that she's spectacular. Um, she's Actually, like my that, she's in my top five performances of the year, and I would. I mean, that entire cast is superb. I would just, love I to was, see her. In. Oh, I mean, that film just completely overwhelmed me. I was, I was, it's one of my top fives of the year. I think it's stunning. I just um, watched it like, again I'm the totally other night. Okay with- <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's. I mean, that ending was just. Oh, I could talk for hours about it. Really, it was. I, it, it, once the end credits started, and I realized there was no music on it, it kind of hit me even harder somehow. It, isn't um, that exactly right? There's no score, and then you hit that last moment, and it's. I mean, the the feeling is just like goosebumps, hair, heartbeat, everything. You're just like you're overwhelmed. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, I could talk about that for hours. I, I am very excited that Willem Dafoe may win his, like, have his entire Oscar season set out for playing probably the most normal person he's ever played. Oh, he's winning. It's, I'm, I know, I, I could not, so. I couldn't be more happy. <laughs> oh, same. It's interesting because I just did a, uh, I'm doing my master's degree in film studies and I, I took a, I, I made up a course on David Lynch and Billy Wilder films. So I rewatched Wild at Heart quite soon before watching The Florida Project. Oh my God. It's like, that dude's got the range. He's so good. Why have we never given him one of these things before? Oh my God. That might be my favorite Willem Dafoe performance. Oh, oh my it's God. so good, but it's just so grotesque. I love him. I'll rip your fucking heart out, girl. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Oh, he's so terrifying. Oh, that was, that was a, a fun viewing double bill, actually. I'll bet. I'll bet. My goodness. I mean, just the scene where he's talking to the cranes just outside the motel. Oh, just this, like, quiet conversation with these birds is just, like, I hope that's his Oscar clip. I really do. I, it's... <laughs> <laughs> that are taking the pedophile to get a can of soda. <laughs> oh my god, I I feel like that's going to be his clip. But yeah, it's I I'm with you. I could probably talk about that movie for an entire podcast because it is so gorgeous. It's so fantastic, and I'm really kind of excited. And I I don't mean this in like a, 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 a to sound like an idiot, but I I feel like it is so specific to a region in the United States and to have somebody so far out from that, to be able to kind of just really grab onto that. I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm excited by that. What, what was it? We're going to totally deviate from this podcast just for a moment to talk about the Florida project. So just buckle up and listen. Um, why did, why did, why did you like it so much? (laughs) I mean, I, I was just completely, in awe at the really specific tone and point of view that it creates. This is a story about you know people who are living in abject poverty that doesn't romanticize poverty. It doesn't you know glamorize it or turn it into some sort of like pornographic festival. Yeah, misery uh, Which porn. I think a lot of it's very bright and vibrant, but it's not you know gruesome about it. But it does manage to take this child's point of view and show you why like a little girl would think that this was the coolest place on earth and how she could make fun and fantasy out of it without ever making it actually fantasy you know you totally see why she would think a giant building that looks like a wizard would be really cool but you never stop realizing actually this place is a dump and Mm -hmm. it's completely abhorrent that these people live like this yeah Uh, and it's so hard to to nail that because i've seen so many films that kind of make being poor seem noble Mm-hmm. And this doesn't. And I love that it was really willing to make these characters so kind of desperate and unlikable. And I've heard criticisms that the the Haley character, uh, Mooney's mother, is too unlikable. But I I appreciate how desperate and kind of de- ho- you know clinging to her pride that she was. Because I have a real problem with people trying to claim that sort of you you, you have to make a working class or you know, very poor person, likable, so that people understand their struggle. It's like, actually, being poor makes you kind of a hard person to deal with, and they don't flinch away from that. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And I thought it was just so expertly done. I mean, and those kids as well, they act like irritating kids, but they're not irritating to watch. You know, they're they're really charming magnetic presences, but they act like kids. Mm. And, and they act like kids who are in really difficult circumstances and cope the way they always have done, even if they don't know that it's a terrible thing. You know, they don't have the Magic Kingdom, so they go smash up abandoned motels. They don't have Splash Mountain, so they spit on car windows. Uh, you know, they have obeyed their own fantasy that is in many ways as valuable as this commodity that Disney sell down the road. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you have this beautiful ending, spoiler alert for people who haven't seen it, but when you have this beautiful ending where they finally kind of... Wait, 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 just, fantasy, just, just, just in case, 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 just but yes, yes, yes. I know, I know, I know that. that ending, and then it kind of comes together, and you realize, you know, the <laughs> importance of having your own fantasies and having this belief that some things will get better, but realizing it's probably not going to. Um, and it's a beautiful movie that's full of life that doesn't flinch, flinch away from the fact that actually, for some people, it doesn't get better. Um, and I appreciated that, and uh, yeah, I oh, I love that movie so much. I really do. <laughs> I know, I know. It's I I can I can probably watch it multiple times. I love yeah. how much it does not talk down to not only the characters in the movie but the people watching it because it it like you said sometimes you know movies want to make poor people very noble and they want to make the people watching it who maybe are not that poor feel weirdly better about having an understanding of people lower than them on on the the social class or financial class and and that i just it drives me crazy i just want to see you know as real people trying to have a real life and real struggle um i love uh, a child's point of view because they don't really have a decision in the life that they are brought into they just have a decision of of you know who they want to play with and what they want to do with the surroundings that they have and i can barely think of a recent movie that does that better than this i just oh my god yeah my... agreed i mean it makes it seem almost deceptively simple what it's doing yes you know i think I, i've heard chris says, oh it's just kind of this like you know lackadaisy you know vignette slice of life of this summer it's like oh, actually no it's doing so much more than that mm-hmm. you know what Willem Dafoe is doing is so much harder than what he makes it look like um, which is one of the reasons I'm just so enthralled by that performance so <laughs> yeah yeah, the Florida Project for everything as far as I'm concerned and I think it will actually do quite well in the long run It's it's got that kind of power behind it I think the people that do see it like us you know you end up just wanting to talk about it all the time well, and, and, you know, it's not only is Willem Dafoe doing really well with the Critics Awards, but Sean Baker's doing pretty well. He's got two director wins, including one from New York. Um, Detroit gave it their best picture. Uh, I, 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 I think it's a movie that, I'm, not that we're underestimating, but that can possibly do better than even than we think that it might do. So, okay, so... That was that was a little rant and conversation <laughs> about the Florida Project. I hope you enjoyed that, uh, and we'll get back to Screen Actors Guild as a whole uh, right now. Um, <laughs> I'm really glad we did that because I don't talk about that movie enough, and I've seen it three times now. And after we finish this, I'm gonna want to watch it again because that's just how I, I feel about it. So yay! I, I I don't disagree with that decision. I really want to see it again. I I am in love with that film. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, so we've kind of covered a little bit of a little bit of lead actress. Now we kind of more did that with the Golden Globes. Uh, whatever, who cares? Um, the, the the majority of what we talked about with SAG was Mudbound and where that might get in, um, and kind of how we are with something like Dunkirk uh, uh, getting into cast. I uh, I. Like I said, I feel strongly about Call Me By Your Name, even though some people might look at that as a two-hander, the way that, that La La Land kind of was looked at. But um, let's let's look at supporting actress or female actor in a supporting role because I'm kind of excited about this. This is one of the few categories where I have my top five and then I have one, two, three, four, five other possibilities because I'm, I, I don't want to be... I don't want to be bored by this. I don't want to be expected. And I feel like four of these 
the, the, the women that I have predicted or expected. And I want the fifth to be kind of a surprise or somebody. Um, I, I mean, I have, you know, Holly Hunter and Laurie Metcalf and Allison Janney and Octavia Spencer and Mary J. Blige, but I want to see Hong Chow or Catherine Keener or Tiffany Haddish. That would be awesome. See, I, I have Tiffany Haddish in my list because I, I that is one of those performances that people get very excited about. She's having such a good year and she is very ever present on the talk show circuit and promotional tour right now because she also has a book out. Mm-hmm. You know, like the timing on that is perfect. Um, and I, I also think that it's just in terms of, you know, that supporting actress category is also very comedy heavy anyway. Yep. So it just feels like it would be a natural fit anyway. I mean, if you're going to have in Laurie Metcalf and Alison Janney and Holly Hunter, as I do, you know, why not have Tiffany Haddish as well? That's the kind of thing that would get people excited and talking about it. And as we know, these shows desperately need people to watch them because their ratings every year are not doing great. And mm-hmm. they do consider these things. So I think Haddish would be the kind of thing that would get people really revved up, although there are plenty of other examples of things that would. Um, if she doesn't get in, I, I think Octavia Spencer is probably the next safe, safest bet. She's a, you know, a regular here. She's mm-hmm. a, she's fun. She's been nominated for, she's she's a familiar face. Um, and it's a film, you know, that if it doesn't get in in the main category, then there are other places it's going to get in, particularly with Sally Hawkins. And maybe one of the Michaels in supporting. <laughs> yes, I, I, I mean, this is just a category like last year. Uh, the Globes, SAG, and the Oscars were the same five picks all year. And it was it was very easy to predict at that point, and it was just kind of like, okay, well, here we are. We're, we don't need to expect anything else, and, and we're not going to see anything else. So I, I just, I, I, I don't want that. And when I look at, at my, my list for the Globes and my list for SAG, it's starting to look really, really similar. It's a lot of moms, <laughs> and it's a lot of comedy which is fine, but I just, I'm like, I, I, I want to, I want to see something else. I want to see Lois Smith in Marjorie Prime. I want to see something that just kind of, even if this is the only place that they show up, that people go, oh my gosh, I have not thought about that performance. Maybe I should watch that movie or maybe I should consider that more. It's, it would be kind of great. It would be kind of awesome. Um, I'm, I'm a little worried about Haddish just in terms of how late her uh, her ascent was. It was so funny. There were all of these articles before awards, you know, critics awards started that were like, you know, Tiffany Haddish must get an Oscar nomination. And there was this great push. And it's like, all right, well, put your money where your mouth is. And then New York did. <laughs> they, they did exactly that. And that is how you, that's how you start a campaign for somebody that deserves it but may not have the backing for it and and that could she could ride she could ride it all the way through but what i don't want people to do is is to make the melissa mccarthy comparison because it's not really that fair and it's not they're not going to have a similar trajectory so i just i i just hope that people treat haddish and look at haddish as her own uh entity and not as as a comparison to somebody else yeah, I mean, one of the things that the like these awards bodies really like is stuff that they've seen before or something they can make a really easy comparison to, which is one of the reasons you keep seeing you know, the same people appear over and over again, particularly when you get to TV, which was kind of a, a fascinating hot and cold run for me writing those predictions. Uh, so, <laughs> that, so then supporting that is a one that, you know, you I think being a, an old hand at this will benefit. Um but, you know, the, once again, there are so many things that you could fill this out with. Like, we know Melissa Leo loves a good hustle. Why not put her in for that nun movie? Nativiate? Is that how it's pronounced? I don't know. No, novitiate? Novitiate. Okay. My apologies, Miss Leo. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that, that does matter. That's something that people really count on. Because I think, with, even though you hear it every year, it's, you know, we don't care about the campaign. It's just an honor to be nominated and stuff. People like it when you kind of pander to them. You know, they like yes. to feel loved. Yes. Nobody more than the Globes, but yes, that is absolutely true. That's why all these meet and greets and red carpets and handshaking and lunches are, are really important. I mean, Eddie Redmayne, you know. <laughs> Sorry. Just but, instinctive. Can't help myself. I mean, you know, I mean, that's that just that. Yes. We'll just leave that at that because 
I think it's pretty obvious what that means. Um, <laughs> oh, it just haunts me, that man. He really does. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm just not even about it, but yes. Um, okay. Let's, I'm, <laughs> how, how about, how about, how about, do you have like, like full SAG predictions? Like, I did actually do, and I went all in on TV as well, because... Oh. I have, um, I have ignored television for both those, and I feel bad because it's the first time I have. But I'm like, I am so wrapped up in the film side of these. I'm like, I need to get like a staff of people so they can do like television and stuff because I'm, I'm just, oh my god, it's too much. <laughs> yeah, I was just kind of like, I mean, television was such a fascinating year, particularly in terms of big film actors going to TV. I mean, Big Little Lies is such a talking point, even now. Mm -hmm. um, now that they've got the second season coming up, which I have very mixed feelings on. I am not okay um, with it, but yes. It's like, it's so good that someone's given Andrea Arnold all this money and creative power and all these actresses, but it's like, does it have to be for this? I know. I'm like, the first season was awesome. How about you guys create another project together and do something else? But all right, whatever. I mean, they actually own the rights to the newest Leanne, uh, Leanne Moriarty book. Why not just do that? Like, yeah, whatever. Like, that's its own problem. Um, <laughs> so I, that, I, mean, I did get into those sort of predictions of just stuff like, you know, I, that, I think that's one of those things where you will see those big film stars do very well in the TV division. Like, I think Nicole sure. Kidman is going to do very well. I think, I mean, miniseries actor... It could go Alexander Skarsgård. It could go to Robert De Niro. I I would love to see it go to Kyle MacLachlan. I know. Um, I'm really kind of hoping that happens. I'm oh, really I mean, hoping. that's one of the things I've got for the with the Globes as well. Is just like I feel like they are all just going to be way too scared of Twin Peaks to not nominate it, but they're also too scared, too scared of it to let it win. But <laughs> everyone likes Kyle MacLachlan. So uh, yeah. I, I why, hope, why wouldn't you? I hope so. I hope I hope it does too. Um, but, but yes, but on, on, on the movie side, is there, is there anything that you're kind of looking at as the, the, maybe it's only going to show up here kind of thing? Cause I have one of those and I know I should have more. Um, but I can, I, I'm probably going to officially predict Patrick Stewart to get in for Logan. But, oh, I would love that. But, I really would. But likely only at Screen Actors Guild. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I'm just oh, so annoyed that film isn't getting a bigger campaign than it is. You know, if Wonder Woman is going to get a campaign, why not Logan? It's easily one of the best films of the year. But Curse it you, is. Greatest showman. Curse your greatest showman. It's all your fault. <laughs> um, but, but that's like we were talking about earlier. 20th Century Fox is pushing Logan like crazy, and they are not pushing uh, Greatest Showman. So it's... Well, someone needs to tell Hugh Jackman. <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, it's okay. You can song and dance somewhere else. It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I've put Daniel Kaluuya in for actor. In oh, I SAG. have him in. I have him in. Um, I think that fifth spot is up for grabs. And I think a lot of it is going to come down to the, the kind of surrounding buzz of what the projects um there are actors who are fighting for it like jake gyllenhaal is still hustling very hard for that oh, spot girl you know how i feel about him so oh yeah i, I am i am very happy that that jake wants it you know i i kind of love him trying so hard to be very you know very sister and serious actor but he mm -hmm. also just really wants to be loved he um does. I'm very excited that he's playing a crazy prospector in a jacques odiard movie next year so <laughs> I, I, I love his choices. I think he's got a great year too. He had, with with between Okja and and Stronger, it's like here's the opposite ends of the spectrum of what you know somebody can do. I just I love it. Yeah, I wouldn't be mad at him getting in. I think that it would feel right. Um, I think that one of the things that we are seeing with the changing tides and how we look at awards worthy films and the idea of a prestige film is we're looking at notions of disability in film as well yes because i remember a long time we were all talking about well andrew garfield's definitely going to get in for playing the guy with polio yep and that film wasn't very good which obviously didn't help it but there was also just that surrounding narrative of actually i feel kind of wrong doing this narrative again i feel wrong having another story about a man who overcomes strife and then it makes all of the people who live without disabilities feel very happy. Mm -hmm. um, I think Stronger mostly avoids that. You know, it feel, It's a much more authentic movie. It really is not interested in being that kind of saccharine story. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's, there's, there's a little bit of back patting, but it's not 
obs- you know, it's not violently so. Um, and it helps from you know Gyllenhaal doing that. He's just a much better actor. Um, but I think I think Daniel Kaluuya is going to get in in that fifth spot just because you know just it, it's it's get out and what he is doing in it is stunning. Actually, I think that entire cast is great. I even like Alison Williams in that movie. And I've never, um, like, she's amazing. Oh my I, I, god! I love that people are now just deathly terrified of Alison Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not the character, her, which is, I just love that. Um, so I, I would love to see him get in that. And it's just, he's, he was in Skins and UK TV as well, which mm-hmm. is really it's just fascinating to see him doing so well. Um, I, I don't have him in Golden Globes for some reason, uh, but I, I do have him in SAG. Let me I, I think that could be a good push for getting into Oscar season. But, you know, we're all just waiting to see how that greatest showman plays out. It really could be a game changer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I have I have Kaluuya in for the for the Globes. Just it it seems a little a, a little bit easier uh, for him to even get in there. But uh, I I have him here too at SAG. So, oh my God, it's super yeah, risky. I have Jillian Hall at Globes and I have Kaluuya at SAG. Which, but I think you could probably swap swap those two around and it would make as much sense. I also have in Golden Globes for actor in a musical comedy. I have Adam Sandler. Ooh, I've yes. seen it. I've seen a couple of that. I know. I, mm-hmm. I mean, he's slightly trying more than he usually does, which isn't saying much because that's such a low bar. But it's a Netflix film, and and the Globes have absolutely no problem nominating Netflix films. No. And, you know, they like it when, you know, th- those kind of big names do something vaguely different. And I say vaguely, like, just, just a iota different. Um, I, I don't think he's going to win. I, I think that's going to be... I, I wish I liked the movie more. It's probably my least favorite Noah Baumbach, but... I, I was kind of hot and cold on it. I, I generally am a bit frosty on Baumbach anyway, although I did love While We're Young. Mm. Um, it's the first time I felt like a movie kind of got hipsters. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't really anything for me to write home, but, but it's not my kind of movie in that aspect anyway. Yes. Uh, what else do I have? <laughs> I mean, I, I've been really kind of hot and cold on whether or not I was going to see Margot Robbie do well at the sags or even get in at the sags now they they got screeners they're they're gonna do well and and it's also that's a very kind of traditional award story which is you know the beautiful glamorous ingenue who kind of goes quote unquote ugly for the biopic and she's not like there was a story in vogue saying the hardest thing about getting her ready for this role was because she's just so naturally beautiful it's like really (laughs) she's an incredibly pretty woman but she's hardly playing you know the fish man in the shape of water like like, let's calm down um but it's like i think that film also benefits from it it's cool Mm -hmm. like that's a film that people are really like excited about it and also just it has that kind of like slightly abrasive edge to it it's not a traditional biopic and it's not even you know that film could have so easily slid off slid off the rails in terms of how it talks about quote unquote white trash mm-hmm. and i haven't seen it but the reviews for it have suggested that it doesn't do that and oh no it's fun i love it it's... So that, that's exciting and i like margot robbie so you know it's nice to see her doing something that isn't suicide squad so yes i'm cool with that and and, um, and i am too i mean i i love her in it even though she doesn't look anything like tanya harding and she doesn't sound anything like her it's so bizarre but i didn't care even though i you know i was still longing for the the old in development days of you know like amy adams you know playing her like 15 years ago mm-hmm. Because oh, yeah, that. that would have worked 100%. But Margot Robbie doesn't look a lick. Not even the tiniest bit like her. Uh, which is so funny because they really concentrated on all of the supporting cast. Having a really good passing resemblance as the people that they were playing. And it's like, nah, we just kind of want to have Margot Robbie do this. Maybe this will be like her, her, uh, her Charlize Theron and Monster. And let's just see where we go and action. And she's great, and it's a fucking hilarious movie. I am fascinated to see how that plays in places like where I'm from, because for us, Tonya Harding is a joke in The Simpsons. Mm. Like, you know, that, that Treehouse of Horror where she's got the, the crowbar and she's on the spaceship? Like, that is the only way that most people around here know who she is. So I am curious to see if that's that will, you know, even play a part in how this film does here. Um because I think I've actually already had to explain to like some of my family members who Tonya Harding was. Yeah. So, but I, I I don't think that'll matter in the long run because I think it's more about how this plays to American audiences. To be honest, that that's all she needed to do. 
Yes. She needs to play well the festival circus with critics and with the right roars. And I think that she's doing that really well. Let's talk about someone who's doing the hustle really well. Mm-hmm. Getting Tonya Harding to do the red carpet with her. Yes. Like, I, oh, I knew, bless. She, I, she worked it. She really did. I, I knew as soon as that was going to happen, I'd be like, oh, okay. There you go. There's there's the there's the Philomena. There you go. <laughs> oh, that's a really dark Philomena. <laughs> oh, please tell me, like, the, the For Your Consideration gift bags are going to have, like, candy crowbars or something. I hope so. Or I hope that, you know, like, the actual Tanya Harding gets to go visit the Pope or something fun like that. <laughs> <laughs> But, oh, with the yes. scrunchie. Yes, with the scrunchie. Oh my god. Oh, yeah, that movie's really, really fun. Um, all right, cool. I think I think we can I think we can wrap. Um, and it was really, really wonderful to have you on. And I, uh, I definitely actually want to have you back on for BAFTA. I think you will be perfect for that i am here for that already believe me (laughs) good and and i think everybody listening will want that too um uh kaylee tell everybody if you want to where they can find you on social media and your really fantastic writings because i hope that people leave this podcast and search you out because you're a fantastic writer and a necessary voice so please oh thank you um you can follow me on twitter uh, at Kaylee Ann, which is spelled the Gallic way, just Google Kaylee Donaldson and I will come up. Um, I'm a freelance writer for ScreenRant.com. I write for Sci-Fi Fangirls. I'm, my main stomping ground is Pajiba.com, where I write about uh, lots, mostly pop culture and celebrities. So if you want to come and check out me gabbing about um, Gwen Stefani this week, you can come and check out something <laughs> on the site. Um, I, I pick a celebrity once a week and write a like long form star studies on them. So you can read me talking about Henry Cavill and Constance Wu and Army Hammer and Ree Larson and Jessica Biel and all of these things. And you can make suggestions if you want to tell me a celebrity to write about. Um, I am open to basically anyone. So did yeah, you say Henry nuts. Cavill? Oh, I've already done Henry Cavill. Yeah. Okay, because I'm going to need to go and read that like 14 times. Okay, bye. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it's there. People really enjoyed that one. So I I'm always switching back. over. Anyways. Perfect. All right. Awesome. Cool, Kaylee. And you can always find me at awards underscore watch on Twitter and awardswatch.com and Facebook and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Um, the Golden Globe nominations come out on Monday, December 11th, uh, 538 in the morning because they're assholes. Um <laughs> And it's fine by me. I, I'm eight hours ahead. I'm okay with that. Exactly. I, there's like, like a couple of times I've been in uh, Europe over the the period of different nominations, and I'm like, oh, cool. So I get to do a nominations announcement at two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm okay with that. Uh, and then Screen Actors Guild is Wednesday the 13th. Uh, like I said, I do have my uh, Golden Globe nominations up and for viewing and mocking. Uh, and then I will have my Screen Actors Guild ones up probably this weekend since Monday, Tuesday will be completely overrun with Golden Globe. Oh my God, I can't believe they got in and oh my God, I can't believe they didn't conversations. Um, so that's it for now for Oscar podcast number 60. I think we'll have another one very soon. These will become very fast and furious throughout the next couple of months. And Kaylee, I want to thank you, thank you, and bow and thank you for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. This was a ball. I had a great time. Wonderful. All right, everybody. Goodbye.